You're all for us. And Lord, we're a needy people. So Lord, we stand before you. Great. For the empty tomb and the chance of new life. Lord, I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my, in my life. I awaken every day thankful that yesterday has passed. And there's hope for this day. Thank you, my Lord, my Savior, for being my living hope. So, Lord, in the next few moments, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you. <coughs> and, Lord, preach your word by the power of your spirit upon our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation 4, verse 11 speaks about a time in the future where the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints alike will shout out to Jesus Christ, our Savior, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and praise. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The, the words of the saints in glory future will be, thank you, O Lord, for giving us life. And thank you, Lord, that that life is good. And Lord, thank you for sustaining us every step of the way. Because you created us, and by your will we exist, and by your will we have this living hope. <clears throat> Let me introduce to you this God of creation, because it says we understand then from where we came. The God of creation, perfect, always in time past. There's not one thing that came from the hand of God that was not good and right and perfect. And it has been attacked by sin. But that God is not the author of sin. He is the creator of that which is good. The definition of God is perfect. And everything that comes from His hand is perfect. But can I say we got in the way? But before that, the God who was perfect, who created those messengers called angels or archangels or seraphim or cherubim, they all resided together in the perfect harmony that is God's love. And God reached out. Can you think of a world without sin? Can you think of a world where everyone loves everyone? Can you think of a world that is only touched by peace? The, uh, the uh, angels work together in harmony of the rhapsody of life. Adam, created by God, had a job. <coughs> he would walk with the angels in peace, but he also walked with the animals and named them one by one. We don't know how long that took, but everywhere that he went, he was in perfect harmony with all. In love, the lion with the lamb, the serpent, even then, standing tall in its beauty. And he named them all, one by one. There was peace that was there. Adam was alone, so God made Eve. And they came together and became a, a helpmate to each other. And they walked through that time, once at this point, not touched by time. We don't know how long they were there. But they were in perfect harmony. And they walked with God in peace. And there was love. And it was good. Every day splendid. Every bloom fresh. No thorns. No heartache. No pain. All in perfect relationship to God. In perfect harmony. In the peace of God. But yet pride came. First to the angels. They thought they were as good as God. And pride always comes before the fall. And their sins separated them from God. And we see something become broken. Shattered. Panic. Dark. Anxiety. Grass. The life of a fallen angel seeking for an escape, but finding none. Nothing but pain. Taking their pain out 
on others because they found that there was no remedy to their brokenness. It was irrevocable. So their existence only got worse and worse. They were, set, they were made for so much more, but they settled for so much less. Then there was Adam and Eve. And all it took was a little temptation. The pride found itself again in Genesis 3. God's Word tells us that they were there in the garden. And then after they sinned, it says the eyes of both of them were opened and that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day before they walked with him. But now they just hear his voice. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Before they had harmony of relationship. But now they're hiding himself. The Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? He knew where he was. But Adam was hiding. So he said, I, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Listen to me now. Before they walked without shame, without reproach, with no regret, with no remorse, but sin brought shame. Now they're hiding themselves. Now they're trying to cover their nakedness. And by the way, naked and afraid is not just the name of a TV show. <laughs> there are many that are walking the streets that we see every day that may have clothes on, but they're still living in shame and regret, trying to hide, trying to find peace in all the wrong places. Can you hear me? You know what I'm talking about. By the way, it's in every family. And it's in every generation. And it's in every place. And sometimes we'll flock together with other people like us and we'll try to put on a face and we'll try to hide and say that we're good. But all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. There's not any big, big ones and little ones. There's not any perfect ones left. Just the forgiven and the unforgiven. All that have the love of God. Just some that haven't found the freedom that comes from the blood of the cross of Calvary. They found themselves broken. They found themselves away from God. I want to bring up some verses in Genesis 3 that's very seldom talked about. It's at the end of the chapter in verse 22. Please listen very intently to these words. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, speaking of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, to know good and evil. Before they knew good, but now they know the evil as well. He said, And now let, lest he put his hand out and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. There was a, a tree there called the tree of life. If you took the fruit of it, you would eat of it and you would have eternity in the state that you're in. So God said in verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man. He placed cherubim at the east of the end of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God said, you have sinned. Our relationship is broken. I do not want you to remain there. If you take this fruit of this tree of life, you will remain in the condition that you're in. But the author had a plan from the beginning. He knew that they would sin. He knew we would sin. He would do something would have to take the place. He knew something would have to make a way. So God, in His wisdom and His love, before He even created the heavens and the earth, had a plan of redemption. Amen. It's called, the, the theological word is called propitiation. 
That's a big word. It means something had to come take my place. Something had to take my sin. It was mine. I did it. I deserved the punishment. It was, I stood in need of the mercy of God where God would not give me what I deserved, but give me better. But I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. And God knew that. And he sent his son. His only begotten son. There's a verse, chapter and verse that we know most of us who study the word of God know very well. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short, have fallen short of the glory of God. But listen to the next two verses. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the buying back that is in Christ Jesus. He bought back my sin. Listen to this. Whom God set forth as a propitiation as my pain, my place, my redemption, my salvation, God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance, God passed over the sins which were previously committed. He passed over, put them on him. First John 2, 2 said, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, listen to me now, for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. 1 John 4.10. In this is love. You want to talk about love? This is love. Not that we love God. We can't ever do enough in loving God. We can't do enough in the service of God to appease our sin. But that he loved us and sent his Son. To be the payment, the satisfaction, the propitiation for our sin. That's the cross, folks. That's the cross. I, I was born in church. I was actually not, I was born in a hospital. But they, <laughs> I, I heard preaching my whole life. I saw the symbols, I saw the cross. And I knew, that fundamentally I knew that I have what I have because of what Christ did. I grew up knowing that and I've been a preacher for a lot of years. But can I say that I've never found the full satisfaction of understanding the payment of my sin? I, I, I've never understood why Christ had to go through what he went through. I've never understood why there couldn't have been another one. By the way, I don't understand why he would love me like that. Arrogant, stubborn, prideful, prime. To know that as I look at that cross, I was the one deserving the shame. I was the one deserving. I was the one who committed it. We have, we have grown so accustomed to the cross that we forget the pain. We forget this is one who did not deserve it. If there was anyone who deserved to be honored, and if there was anyone who deserved to have his name praised and glorified, it was Christ who every act of everything that he did was out of love. But he received back mocking. They spat in my Savior's face. They slapped him. An open face slap is a mocking thing. To, to reach and pull out his beard is just anger to grab and just want to inflict on him. To mock the king of kings who came from the throne in glory and stripped him of all clothes, put that royal robe on him, the crown of thorns, take that reed and put it as a sepulcher, take the reed away from him, and beat him with that reed. This is the king of kings we're talking about. And yet he never said a word. Not one. Oh, what love, our Savior. The depths that he would go to, 
deletes. Sometimes we think of the cross being high where people would look up at him. But no, it would, it would fall into the ground. His feet would really be only about 12 inches above the ground. And as you know, he was so, after the cat of nine tails, the 39 lashes, after the beatings and the mocking, he was so empty of strength that he fell down. So literally, you could have walked up to him on the cross and looked at him in the face and they said all kind of mean, harsh words. And yet, Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He walked through it. My sin being placed upon him. I believe that was the hardest pain of all of it, don't you? When God could not look upon sin, we try to pump it up a little bit. We try to put a band-aid on it a little bit, but just understand this. God could not look at sin, and Christ became sin for us. And for the first time in all of eternity, there was a separation in the Godhead. Relationship, yes, but fellowship broken. Where ours was broken, he allowed his to be broken so ours could be healed. But it would be nothing to serve another martyr who just died a noble death and was put in a tomb. That would be nothing. Matter of fact, if, if 1 Corinthians 15, if that's all we've got, we need to go home. If, if there is no resurrection, then, then we need to go home. There is no life. There is no hope. Amen. But on Resurrection Sunday, morning, hope came alive again. <laughs> you know, I think Satan thought he had him on the cross. But on that Sunday morning, he knew that he was doomed and damned and defeated. Because hope came back. See, because Satan knew if he got Jesus, he got all of us. So they went to the tomb. He wasn't there. 1 Corinthians 15 said he was seen by Peter, the one who denied him. But the Lord came back. Does that not give you hope? How many of y'all messed up? Oh, that was an amen moment. <laughs> and I don't care how many times you've messed up. I don't care how many times you've cursed. I don't care how many times you've given up. Christ came back to love on you, too. Amen. He was seen by the apostles, the twelve. They had all left him. One of them left so quick. <laughs> He left his clothes behind. He was going to find some younger. But yet, he came back to let them know, so here I am. By the way, guys, I told you so. I told you I was going to go to Jerusalem, that they would take me and crucify me, but I told you three days later I'd be back. Here I am. By the way, he had that say before on Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. <laughs> Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians says over 500 saw him at one time. I'm not talking 10, but people say, oh, it was a conspiracy. Number one, they put him in a tomb guarded with officers and soldiers who would have, if, if, if someone got to him, they would have to give their life because they did not guard the tomb. But the tomb was empty. It was rolled away. Amen. Now 500 saw him. It says, it says, listen to me now, more than 500 saw him at one time. I can't get 10 people to say the same thing, much less over 500. And, and, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, and by the way, most of them are still alive. In our courts today, you are found innocent or guilty by the witnesses of the people. 500 came forth as witnesses. We saw him. He's alive. Also, he had a brother. How many of y'all have siblings? How many of y'all have ever fought with your siblings? <laughs> I 
I mean, you're bought over anything, right? James was a non-believer. James thought he was foolish. But when James saw the risen Lord, if there was ever a greater witness than James, and James' life was absolutely changed, he became an apostle. He became the, the foundation stone in the church in Jerusalem. And when all the other saints were scattered because of the persecution, James stayed. They called him camel meat because he prayed so much. Acts 15, when there was an understanding or a misunderstanding about what they would do with these new Gentiles who were getting saved, they came, but James found himself helping. Helping. You see, when God saves, He saves to the utmost. And I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him. James got it. You know, Paul said, yeah, even me, I'm born out of season. <coughs> By the way, that's Brian's testimony. I was born out of season. There was a building that at one time had been a funeral home that had been changed into a church. I had been fighting it for a while. Sat back on the second and third row, right over on this side on a Sunday night. I felt like I was going to explode. I knew what I needed to do. You see, I believe in God. It takes more than that. I believe in Jesus. It takes more than that. The Bible says Satan believes those things and even trembles because of it. But you see, I knew that there was still something separating me from him, my sin. And what I had to do and what all of us had to do was I had to go to him, confess my sin. Lord, I messed up. And I need somebody to take the place. I need somebody to forgive me. You're the only one who can. And I asked God to do for me what only he could do, and he did. And listen to me. I am grateful. I'm not the same. I'm not perfect. Far from it. But you see, standing before you, a saint of God. Well, that should have been an amen, too. <laughs> if you're a Christian, every one of you are a saint of God. One day I'm going to breathe my last breath. And y'all can come to my funeral if you want. But don't be sad. Brother Mark sang my favorite hymn this morning in Christ Alone. You've seen that, Liam. Because I believe that song is the full testimony of all of it. And it begins and it ends with saying, We have died in our sin, but he rose from the grave for our sin. Amen. And one day he's coming back. He's going to call us to himself. I don't know when. I've seen some mighty bad accidents. I've seen some terrible things. I've seen some hard things in life. I've seen people who have question marks about life. I understand that. Y'all listen to me. I know. I know. But I can tell you one thing. The Bible says absent from the body is present with the Lord. If I breathe my last breath today, I don't care what you do with this old body, I'm going to be with him. Forevermore. Forevermore. You see, there's one thing that we can't do anything about, and that's death. But there's one thing we can do something about, and that's sin, the separates. And that's to go to the one and ask him to do for us what only he can do. By the way, you've already done that, your life doesn't belong to you. It's been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. He bought you, he paid for you, he sealed you, he will keep you, and he will take you to heaven one day. But until then, you're supposed to be served in him. There's a miracle that happens. I've seen it happen so many times. I've never been, I've been at the bedside when someone's gone to the Lord. But I've never been at the bedside for a resurrection. Yet it happened every time I saw them leave this life. They went to glory. I couldn't see it with my eyes. But I knew it happened. Y'all hear me? The miracle was there. It doesn't matter the age. 
It doesn't matter if they're a few years old. It doesn't matter if, if, if they're 90 years old. What matters is it comes. I close with this. There was a man by the name of William Setzer. He was a professor at Wilford College in Spokane, Washington. And he was in a minivan with his family. And they were hit by a drunk robber. He lost three generations at once. He lost his mom, he lost his wife, and he lost his daughter. I can only imagine. He wrote a book called A Grace Disguise. And he took from that a, a line in one of Robert Frost, Frost's writings where Frost said, you never go around the issue, you go through the issue. And I, let, me, let me give you this quote. I want to, I wrote it down because I want it to be exactly the way he said it. This is his quote. The quickest way for anyone to reach the sun and the light of day is to not to run west chasing the setting sun, but to head east plunging into the darkness until one finds the sunrise. It's not a matter of we'll face darkness or struggles or pain. It's what you do with it. Will you run to the west trying to find what you lost in the setting sun? Will you sit down and moan? Or will you set out east and run into the darkness. Because if you run into the darkness, that's the quickest way that you'll find the sunrise where there's light and hope. Psalms 30, verse 5, says it better than I ever could. Weeping may endure for a night. Do you know the rest of that verse? But joy comes in the morning. Light, brokenness, Anxiety, fear, shattered dreams, questions, life's full of Christ came to make a way. Christ didn't come here to make us perfect here, or in this world perfect here. But he made us perfect in him to take us where we could go back to eternity forever and be perfect. It's about you can listen very patient and I thank you so very much for that but if you just come to hear a sermon or hear a song you came here to appease someone I thank you for that but yet there's something so much more important you see Christ loves you he went to the cross of Calvary for you and he didn't stay in the grave. He rose again for you. He is alive. He is well. And you may say, preacher, I believe that. Well, sin separates, but God puts back together. So let me ask you, if you come to a place in time in your life where you've asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life, to be your Savior, your Lord, your Master, have you given Him your life so that He can give you eternal life? Pastor, I don't know how to do that. Just a prayer from your heart to His heart. Oh, how beautiful it is. Just speak it in your own words. He's a gentleman. He will not force his way into your life. But whether you're a young child or whether you're a, a grown adult, he's waiting for those words to come from you. If you feel that tug of your heart, that's his wooing, that's his drawing, that's his invitation. Would you give your heart and life to him?
Would you change eternity for your <coughs> own destiny? Father, hear the prayers, O oh Lord, as they come and confess their sin to you. And Lord, and ask you to do for them what only you can do. Ask you to save them and receive the new life. Would you pray that prayer this morning? Surely in a crowd this big, there's someone. I will not embarrass you. If you couldn't get to know me, you'll know that I would do anything other than embarrass you. But if you know that you need to pray that prayer, you've never prayed that prayer, but you should, and you want to, would you just lift your hand? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you just lift your hand? I'm watching God's listening. God's watching. Let me just ask, if you're here today and you know that you pray and you've asked the Lord to come into your heart and life, and you know that if you died today that you go to heaven, would you just lift your hand? Some could lift it either way. Father, these are your people. I give them unto you. Your word says that your the word when it's preached it will not return void. So I just pray that you will just do whatever you so choose. Father, we're gonna have an invitation, but Lord, you need to give it because I can't. I can't speak to hearts. I can only speak to ears. I pray, Lord, for the urgency of the moment. Lord, because when you when you call, we need to say yes. So, Father, bless this invitation as only you can, Jesus.